Well, praise the Lord. Here we are again. Good morning. This Tuesday morning, March 2nd. Already. Already. Lord God, a little closer to spring, even though it feels like winter again to this morning. But uh, praise the Lord. Welcome to our faith and healing class. Those that are here in the building, those that are joining us online, we say good morning. Glad you've uh, chosen this part to uh, tune in and feed your faith. Amen. And this is the place where we do feed our faith. Our spirit gets stronger, and uh, we learn how to overcome. And uh, in glory to God, we are making tremendous progress. Yes. To, to God be all the glory. You yes. know, we're just talking here, testimonies and people, and and how we're um, how, how we can verify and, and uh, unequivocally say that the word works. The word works. You know, uh, it is the fight of faith to work the word. Um, it is the battle of the flesh that wants to yield to how it feels, what it looks like, and its five physical senses. But faith is completely opposite of that. Faith has nothing to do with any of those things. Faith has to do with believing and believing what God said. You know, people operate in faith all the time. <coughs> we, uh, you know, if you had listened to us on Sunday morning, uh, we started a series talking about the creative power of saying and what you know, our words and, uh, and really built the foundation upon the fact that people operate in this type of thing all the time. I'm not even talking about Christians. I'm talking about the world in general. They call things that be not as though they are. They are living proof and products of words that have been spoken to them or words that they have spoken to others. And, uh, you know, we're not going to teach on that today. That'll you come on Sunday, and we'll finish along those lines. But uh, have you been, those who have heard it, have you been more conscious of what's coming out of your mouth? I've been asking the Holy Spirit that to, to quicken to me. Every time I speak, may my words uh, be edifying. May they be refreshing. May they bring healing and hope to whoever hears them. You know, every word has can, can, can impact somebody's life. So, glory to God. But, uh, so that's what we've been studying along these lines and, uh, and laying hold of the promises of God. So, uh, we're excited to get into it this morning. And uh, we're going to ask you to release faith together with me as we hear from God. Make sure you have your Bible, something to take some notes. Also, uh, for your uh, benefit, all of our services... Uh, including our faith and healing classes, which run Tuesday through Friday at 1030. They're all on our YouTube channel. You can access them through our website, www.abundantgracechurch.com. All of our Wednesday evening services at 7 o'clock are also archived on there, and our Sunday morning services are archived on there as well. We are meeting live in person. Glory to God. We're, we're thankful for that. Um, but we are still live streaming our services. And I'm just going to say this now. Uh, for, the, for the general well-being, health and well-being of all those who attend in person, we ask that if you're not feeling 100%, stay home and get well. Join us on our live stream, lay hold in faith, there is no distance in the spirit. And if you suspect that you may have been exposed one way or another, or through someone who thought they may have, just let's err on the side of wisdom, not fear, but wisdom, and stay home as well. And, uh, and, and join us on our live stream, and when you know you're 100%, and you know for a fact that you weren't exposed in any way, uh, then come and obviously join us in person. We'd love to see you. Um, just a special note note this Wednesday tomorrow we will not be meeting in person it will be a live stream uh, service only so uh, that's tomorrow for tomorrow and if that is going to be a continued thing for the following Wednesday we will advise you as well but for now definitely just tomorrow Wednesday March 3rd our Wednesday evening service which starts at 7 p.m. will be live streamed only live streamed only and I'll put a message out later uh, but the rest of our services Sunday morning will be in person as well as our live stream so praise the Lord just get all those kind of stuff out of the way <laughs> hallelujah well let's pray let's believe God together that we're going to hear exactly what he knows that we need for today glory to God father we're so thankful that we have the opportunity to get together here and to study and to meditate and to 
to, to partake of your holy word. Father, we know that our faith comes to us by hearing your anointed words. And so, Father, we, we yield to you. We ask the Holy Spirit, the great teacher who you sent to us for that purpose, to teach us today. Father, I yield myself to you as an instrument ready, Father, to speak what you want spoken. It's not about me or any other person. It is about you. It's about you being glorified, Father. It's about you teaching us through your spirit. Give us ears to hear and hearts to receive, Father. Answers to questions, revelation, knowledge, and impartations of your truth, which is making us free. May you bring glory to yourself in all that's said and done, for you deserve all the glory both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. We thank you. Amen. 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 Praise God. Well, let's get into our, uh, our Ephesian prayers before we, uh, Lord, put something on my heart um, today. And we're actually going to, <clears throat> uh, I'll allude to it once we get to our, uh, our prayer in Colossians that we always pray. And I've been just, just stirred in my heart about this. Uh, and that's why I always kind of pause and make mention of it uh, at the beginning of that Colossian prayer. Some of you already know what I'm talking about. But, uh, so we're going to teach along those lines today. The Holy Spirit began to show me some things this morning while I was praying and reading myself. And I believe it's going to benefit us today as well. But for now, let's start in Ephesians. Again, these are our prayers. Uh, prayer, Paul prayed these prayers, and he got results. And it's not ritualistic, it's not a religious thing, it's not a hocus-pocus, if we do it 200 times, puff, something's going to happen. Uh, we believe things are happening every time we read them in faith, and pray them in faith, right? The Lord hears us when we pray. The effectual and the fervent prayer of a righteous individual availeth much. It produces results. So let's pray this together in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 17. Paul's praying here. He says, I pray to you, the glorious Father, the God of my Lord Jesus Christ, that you would give me a spirit of wisdom and revelation as I come to know you better. Then I will have deeper insight. I will know the confidence that you want me to have and the glorious wealth that your people will inherit. I will also know the unlimited greatness of your power as it works with might and strength for me, a believer. You worked with that same power in Christ when you brought him back to life and gave him the honored position, the one next to you, the Father, on the heavenly throne. Jesus is far above all rulers, authorities, powers, lords, and governments, and all other names that can be named, not only in this present world, but also in the world to come. You have put everything under the control of him, you made him the head of everything for the good of the church. The church is his body and completes him as he fills everything in every way. Glory to God. Is he doing that? Yes. He certainly is. Hallelujah. So let's flip over past Ephesians chapter 2, go to chapter 3. And we're going to begin this prayer here in verse 16. Verse 16. Paul continues praying. He says, I'm asking you, God, to give me a gift from the wealth of your glory. I pray that you would give me your inner strength and power through your spirit. That Christ will live in me through faith. Through faith. I also pray that love may be the ground into which I sink my roots and on which I have my foundation. That has a lot to do with what we say, doesn't it? Yes. Love and, and foundation and creative power of speaking things it certainly does. This way with all of God's people. I will be able to understand how wide, long, high, and deep your love is. I will know Christ's love, which goes far beyond any knowledge. I am praying this so that I may be completely filled with you, Father God. Glory belongs to you, whose power is at work in me. By your power, you can do infinitely more than I can ask or imagine. Glory belongs to you and the church and in Christ Jesus for all time and eternity. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And now let's uh, flip over to the book of Colossians. Pass Philippians and go to Colossians. In the first chapter, Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to begin here in uh, verse 9. Colossians 1 and verse 9. 
And again, Paul is continuing to pray here. And I want us to, uh, I always, I always uh, make mention of this, but I'm going to again today uh, make mention and, and, and pay attention to what Paul is saying. What is priority in his prayer here? Because it's going to help us a, a, a lot, a lot. As we make that shift in our own life to what's priorities, we'll see the same fruit. Amen? So uh, Paul continues praying here in verse 9 of Colossians chapter 1. He says, For this reason, I have not stopped praying, seeking you about this. So let's see, what is it? I'm asking you, God, to fill me with the knowledge of your will, the knowledge of his will, the knowledge of his word, through every kind of spiritual wisdom and insight. I ask this so that I will live the kind of life that proves I belong to you, Lord. Then I will want to please you in every way as I grow in producing every kind of good work by this knowledge about you. I ask you to strengthen me by your glorious might with all the power that I need to patiently endure and overcome everything with joy. I also thank you, Father, for you have made me able to share the light, which is what you want me to inherit. You, Father God, have rescued, you've snatched me, you've grabbed me right from the clutches and the power of darkness, and you brought me into the kingdom, the marvelous kingdom of your Son whom you love. Father, we're so thankful that you've done that for us. And Lord, it is our desire to, to know you, know you more, know the power of the resurrection, Father, filled with the knowledge of your word, the knowledge of your word, because our believing, our releasing faith is based on the knowledge of your word. And if we have knowledge of your word, we have grounds to release faith. We have grounds to believe. So we thank you for that today. And we will not stop seeking you concerning the knowledge of your will. And we thank you that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are filled to overflowing. To you be the glory. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. So that's what we're going to talk a little bit about this morning. Uh, we'll get started. I know we've been talking a lot about uh, this is Faith and Healing School. Uh, so uh, you need faith to receive healing, right? Because it isn't whether God is able to. God has already healed us. We lay hold of the promises of God according to our faith. Faith. Now, how does faith come? By hearing. By hearing. And by hearing what? The Word of God. The Word of God. A constant flow of his word will be a constant flow and an and, and outflow of faith. If we're intaking his word, the outflow is going to be faith. It's going to be when a problem arises, we're not going to be shocked. We're not going to be dismayed. We're not going to wonder. We're not going to fear. We're going to, the word of God is going to rise up right out of us. And we're going to speak to our mountain regardless of what it is. Small, big, little, indifferent, doesn't matter. If it's, if it's a promise to us and his word, we will lay hold of it according to our faith. Our faith. Which is why I want to speak this morning about this subject of knowledge. If it was important enough for Paul, then it should be important enough for us. Isn't it? We have scripture, and we, we've talked about this at length too. Uh, you know, you read Psalm chapter 1. You read Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8, and it's talking about this book of the law, or God's words, uh, not departing from our mouth, from our eyes, keeping them in the midst of our heart, meditating, meditating on them day and night. And as we do those things, we're promised. Okay, this is our part that we need to meditate on them. And as we do, faith rises in our heart. We understand knowledge of God's word. We're not hoodwinked. We're not trapped, okay, or snared by what we're saying. We're laying hold of the promise by what we're saying because we have knowledge of his word. Now, if we meditate in, in the stock market, nothing wrong with the stock market, but we know that goes up and down. Some days you're rich, some days you're poor, according to the stock market, right? If we meditate on sports, we know that goes up and down. 
We know that our favorite player gets hurt and then they're sidelined, they're out of the game. Uh, all, all these sorts of things. We can meditate on a lot of different things, can't we? We certainly can, and so many people do. But if we'll choose, and I say the word choose because it's a choice we're going to have to make. Um, people choose to meditate on the stock market, to get involved, to sit there and watch that ticker tape all day long. Okay, people choose to to uh, to to follow sports and know every stat about every player and every team. The same way we choose to do those things and meditate and make that part of our daily life is the same way we need to choose to do this. Now, and every and this is very important. Why am I saying choose? Because it is a choice. Because I hear people all the time say, "Well, I just don't feel like it. I just don't feel like it." Well, he didn't say, if you feel like meditating, he said, blessed is the person who chooses to meditate in my words day and night, day and night. So it's not a matter of if you feel like doing it, because what if you never feel like doing it? Right. You're going to be poor and unhealthy, <laughs> And you're not going to have knowledge of God's word. But if you choose to do it, even when your flesh will tell. And now I'm not saying that feeling like not doing it isn't real. That's real. That's real. Your flesh at times does not feel like doing it. That's because your flesh didn't get born again. <laughs> your spirit did. And your flesh is in the process of being renewed. But we can't renew our flesh to the standard that God wants if we're meditating on the wrong thing. Does everybody understand that? And we're meditating on things that appeal to the flesh, then your flesh is just going to get stronger. If you meditate on things that your spirit desires, then your spirit is going to get stronger. Whatever we're feeding, spirit or flesh, is the thing that's going to grow. So if we're having a problem in different areas of our life, then how do things die? They die of starvation, right? They die of starvation. So if someone tells me I really don't want to do this anymore, if they're serious, if they're serious, then they'll stop feeding that. They'll not make provision. Now, they may not feel like doing that. But again, this is a choice that the individual will make. I don't want to do this anymore. Father, I'm asking for your help. I know I can't do it on my own, but I'm choosing to listen to the Holy Spirit. When my flesh goes to want to do it, I'm going to listen to the Holy Ghost tell me to stop, and I'm going to tell my flesh to shut up, and I'm not going to do it. Friend, that's how you grow. People do that all the time, too. All the time. We can either yield to the flesh, or we can walk in the Spirit, which is life and peace. Walking in the flesh is death and destruction. Ultimately, it'll be death and destruction. Of course, not, not with the enemy, the picture that he gives you right away, because he wants to trap you. He wants to trap you and make you think that everything's okay until he has such a stronghold on you that that's when he drops the hatchet. And, uh, and, but we can have life and peace if we'll walk in the Spirit. So I'm saying all these things because this is a choice. We need to meditate in the Word day and night. Now, Pastor, I know people are saying, you can't meditate in the Word day and night. Says who? Says who? Who says? Your, your flesh, maybe? <laughs> maybe your flesh will tell you, well, you, I can't do that. My favorite show comes on. on. <laughs> Listen, nothing wrong with watching your favorite show. I'm not preaching legalism here. This is a condition of the heart, you know? And every now and again... When the flesh is so pampered and used to getting what it wants, it's good to shock the flesh every so often. And that one day when your favorite show comes on and your flesh is already preparing for it, you say, you know what? I'm going to fast that show tonight and I'm going to spend time in the Word. And your flesh will fight you tooth and nail. Your mind will, what? Why? You could double up tomorrow. No, it's just good to keep, Paul said, I keep my body under. I keep my body under. This is called training. It's called preparation. And it makes it that much easier to hear from the Spirit of God. And it makes it that much easier to obey when the Spirit of God prompts us to do something. Because we're not catering to every whim of the flesh. 
You understand that? If all we do is pamper... Listen, a baby is a baby. Babies need to be pampered and catered to. They need to be fed. They need to be changed. They need to be rocked to sleep. They need to this, that, and every other thing. But how many understand? You don't cheat a 13-year-old or a 20-year-old the way you do a 6-month-old. Why? (laughs) Because there is some responsibility. Now there are 20-year-olds that want to be treated like they're 6 months old. There's 50-year-olds that want to be treated like they're still six months old. But we need to discipline our flesh. We need to train our our spirits to be spirit-led, not flesh-led. Not head-led, not feeling-led, but spirit-led. And the more... I'm trying to give you a little insight how, how we could get proficient in doing that. The more we tell our flesh no, the easier that becomes the easier it becomes. The, every time it raises it up, you just slap it down. Slap it down. Keep slapping it down. Slap it down. Eventually, that head's going to get tired of popping up, and it's going to just stay down. You know, you know they, 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 uh, they did this experiment um, with, they, they were putting fish in an aquarium and sharks on the other side, right? And, uh, and, and so, what they did is they put glass in the same aquarium separating the shark from the other fish right and uh and over time that shark would boom bump into that glass trying to get to them fish trying to get to them fish boom repeatedly boom repeatedly boom repeatedly finally they they noticed that the that the shark stopped bumping into the glass So what did they do? They said, let's see what happens. They took the glass, the partition, out of the aquarium, and the shark never ate any of the fish. Wow. Now, why do you think repetition? So why did I share that little, and I I wasn't even thinking about that at all, but thank God for the Holy Ghost, because that's how our flesh is. Our flesh is when it's trained and pampered to always get what it wants, it's going gonna, it's gonna to bang its head. It's going to keep going. It's going to give you trouble. But if you keep slapping it down, slapping it down, it's going to be like that shark. Eventually, it's going to want to stop running into the, into the wall. And then, and then you walk free from being led by your flesh. You see that? As we consistently put in God's word and we slap our flesh down, and we walk in the Spirit, friend, there's not a promise of God that you will not lay hold of. Not, not one. You will walk in every richness and fullness that God has for His children. Does He want us to have it? Does He want us to enjoy it? He certainly does. Is it His fault that we're not enjoying it? It's not. It's not. It's our flesh. And it's the enemy that stands in the way that doesn't want us to have it. So, what do we need? What did Paul pray? What was priority in Paul's life? What did he say I never stopped praying about? <laughs> Everybody having like a... What, 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 in Colossians, what did Paul... For this reason, I have not stopped praying about this. The knowledge of his will. The knowledge of his word. Knowledge of his word, which is why we're talking about this today. If the more knowledge that we have of his word the more we're going to yield to the Spirit. And without knowledge of His Word, we don't have any basis for our believing. We'll believe the wrong thing based on what we have knowledge of. If we have knowledge of every type of flu symptom, every type of COVID symptom, of every type of... And it's okay to have knowledge of that stuff. But if that's all we know, that's all we know, then what is that going to, what, when we go to believe something, to believe something, you ha, your believing has to be based on something, on knowledge. It could be the wrong knowledge, or, and, it, and that's, that's detrimental, or the right knowledge, which is life and peace. So it is knowledge of God's word. And when you have knowledge of God's word, you begin to speak the right thing. And we know because we started this series, that, uh, that saying has creative power attached to it. Genesis chapter 1. God created everything that we see, not from a bunch of stuff, and he got it on the machine. and ma- He said it. He spoke it. He said, let there be light. And there was light. 
So we can say, let there be health to my physical body. And there will be health based on the knowledge of his word. That's what you're believing. That's what you're believing. Now, if you don't have knowledge of his word and you have knowledge that uh, the population is getting sicker and sicker and that once you've gone this far in this, that it's over, then what's going to come out of your mouth? The very thing you have knowledge of. And what it, what's that going to be? It's going to be death. You'll start speaking your symptoms. You'll start speaking what you have knowledge of. And that is what creates, listen, words that we say today, they shape our tomorrow. They do. We could be experiencing things in our life now for decades of saying the wrong thing. But we could turn that around. Right. We, we, we could stop that immediately by start saying the right thing. Start saying what you know. But in order to know what to say, you have to know what's in here which is where we're at today. So if you have your Bible, open up to Proverbs chapter 2. Chapter 2, and we're going to get into this. I was, uh, <clears throat> I was reading uh, this morning and, and studying, and, uh, and the Lord just really bought some, um, bought some really awesome things to my heart, and I... Uh, I, I also, uh, as I was as I was preparing, I thought of you know I, I've read a book when I was very involved in firefighting and coming up through the ranks and you know testing for different spots you know lieutenant captain chief and so on and so forth. I, I did a lot of studying along those lines of uh, you know not so much just firematics but then the management side of it you know being a chief isn't so much the hands-on tactics it's managing the scene and everybody else that's that that's that's going on and understanding you know you have to have an overall understanding but there was one um, there was uh, a book by a, a Jersey City uh, chief a deputy chief there and he wrote a book fire ground size up and part of the thing that was in there is talking about how knowledge is wealth <clears throat> how knowledge is wealth and uh you know uh, th that that's saying and agreeing with exactly what the scriptures tell us you know and, and so I, I can remember reading those things and studying those things and gaining a good knowledge of fire ground Tactics, size up, all those kind of things, and uh, and 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 it and it presented, and in knowing those things, it helped to have a lot of successful outcomes, not only for the job at hand, but for all the manpower and the men that I was responsible for. And uh, so, knowledge is wealth. It's wealth. There's a quote that I want to read to you um, by Henry Ford, and I, and I think this will help us out too. And then we're going to get right into Proverbs chapter two. And we'll see how important that this is. The entrance of his word gives us what? Light. Gives us knowledge. Gives us wisdom. But, uh, but Henry Ford says this. If money is your hope for independence, you will never have it. The only real security that a man will have in this world is a reserve of knowledge, experience, and ability. Think about that. That's Henry Ford. Do you think he was pretty successful? Yeah. Do you think he earned the, the, <laughs> the qualification to be able to make a quote like that? And that's only one, but I thought of that because I started thinking, you know, wealth is knowledge. And in reading one of these books by this d deputy chief, he goes into that, how wealth is knowledge, you know? So now let's go right into the scriptures and look and see what it says. Proverbs chapter 2, and I'm going to read from the Amplified for the next couple of minutes here, and we're just going to go through this. And we're going to trust the Holy Ghost to help us and teach us this morning. He already is helping us. But uh, uh, Proverbs chapter 2, beginning in the very first verse. It says, My son. Now this is, these first four verses are a buildup to verse 5. Okay? So it, it's like the big crescendo. He reiterates himself and is hammering, hammering. Uh, um, David into, into uh, Solomon is hammering into him the importance of what he wants to tell him in verse 5. He says, My son, if you will receive my words and treasure my commandments within you so that your ear is attentive 
to skillful and godly wisdom and apply your heart to understanding, seeking it conscientiously and striving for it eagerly. Yes, if you cry out for insight and lift up your voice for understanding. If you, he's still not done. If you seek skillful and godly wisdom as you would silver and gold and search for her as you would hidden treasures. Verse 5. Then, then. In other words, there's no other way. Then and only then you will understand the reverent fear of the Lord. That is worshiping Him and regarding Him as truly awesome and discover the knowledge of God. Let's look at all those again. Now again, what is, what is David trying to impart to his son? To discover the knowledge of God. Was David considered a man after God's own heart? He was a friend of God. He was. He was. David understood how important to have, how important it is to have the knowledge of God. Paul understood, which is why he said, I never stop seeking you about this, to be filled with the knowledge of your word. Friend, it is life and death, and it's going to get even more Critical. You know why? Because we're not six months old anymore. We are in the last of the last days. God is looking down from above, looking for a church of soldiers who are experienced in His Word, who, uh, who, um, who walk in responsibility and discipline. We need to have knowledge of His Word. It's going to be critical in these last days. That, 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 that especially when there's going to be such an influx of converts coming into the church. Yeah. We need to know how to teach these six-month-olds. Right. <laughs> okay? God's expecting us. And he told us exactly how to do it. This verse 5, the culmination is to understand the fear of God and to discover the knowledge of him. And he said all these things. If you treasure my commandments, if your ear is attentive, if you apply your heart to understanding, seeking it conscientiously, if you cry out for insight and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek skillful and godly wisdom as you would for silver and gold, and you search for it as if you had a map to a hidden treasure, then... And only then will you understand what real fear and reverence is of God. And then you'll discover his knowledge. Those, do those first four verses to you give a picture of somebody who just takes it casual? Uh, you know, I, I, I was stayed up last night because I watched this movie, which I probably shouldn't have watched anyway. But then I slept in, so I didn't have time to get up and read the word today. Does those first four verses depict a person like that? Not even close. Those four verses is a picture of a, a discipline. I picture a soldier focused on his mission, trying to learn as much about the mission as he possibly can. Seeking, hungering, thriving. The scriptures tell us that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness shall be what? Filled. Shall be filled. Is God going to disappoint us and say, eh, well, whatever, I'm just joking with them. They can hunger all they want. They're not going to get anything. No. If we'll hunger and thirst for righteousness, like these verses are saying, we will be filled with the knowledge of God. The knowledge of His Word. Now, why is it? Now, and again, we're going to go over this a uh, little at a time, piece by piece. Why is it important to be filled with the knowledge of His Word? Why is it important to know His Word? Absolutely. It's important to know His Word, or let me say this. His will 
and his word are one and the same, right? Yes. So why is it important for us to know his will? One reason is so if we know what his will is, we can't be tricked into believing something else, all right? But people who don't know his will can be easily duped and tricked into believing the wrong thing. Um, we've talked about this months ago, uh, about, you know, if you have a policy, an insurance policy, we need to know what, the, what our rights and privileges are, <laughs> our declaration page, right? So that we don't pay for something that's already been paid for. Does everybody understand that? So uh, if someone left a, a will in, in their lifetime for you, and there's things in that will that belong to you that they've allocated, this is their last will and testament, this is what their words are, is it important for us to have someone that can explain that and for us to know what the will is of the individual? If we're ever going to embrace what belongs to us, we're going to need to know. We're going to, we're going to need to have knowledge of that will, of that will. It's the same thing with God, but why is it? Why is it that people, Christians in particular, can be saved all for 20 years and have zero knowledge of his will or his word and then stroll into church on occasion and expect to have everything dropped right in their lap. Isn't it foolish? It is. It's foolish. And it's prideful. It's prideful. It is so presumptuous to think, and that's how we treat the things of God, that I, I only want what you can give me. I have nothing to offer you, just whatever, whatever you can give me. Give it to me. And he already did give us everything. But we don't even want to be disciplined enough to find out what it is that he gave to us. Right. We will never fear and worship and reverence God without seeking, hungering, and thirsting for him. Because we won't have the knowledge of his word or his will. Which takes us out of the game. It takes us out of the, of the ability to receive what he has for us because again can you see how this whole thing goes full circle without faith we can't please God right our faith works by our love and faith comes to us by hearing his word hungering and thirsting for him we gain knowledge we can't release faith and believe if we don't have knowledge you can only believe what based on what you know. And if you know nothing, then you can believe nothing. Everybody see that? If you know the wrong thing, then you can only believe the wrong thing. But, why does he say? But if you'll know the truth, the truth will make you free. Those who hunger and thirst for my will and my word will be filled will be filled and then when it comes time to lay hold of the promise of God our believing is based on what his word said Amen. what his word said and that way your, your, your words and your heart agree your words and your spirit agree if you're filled with the knowledge of his will and his word it's going to be evidenced by what we are saying and it's what we say it's what we say that brings results. Yes. Doesn't, what does Mark 11, 23, and 24 say? Let's look at it. It is what we're saying that causes things to happen. The creative power of our words. But if what we're saying is, ev is contrary to God's word, what's coming out, then that's evidence that we're believing the wrong thing or we don't have knowledge. Everyone, this isn't confusing, right? Shouldn't be. This is, if what's coming out of our mouth is contrary to God's word, then that is evidence that we're not full of the knowledge of his word. 
We're not, we're not full of the knowledge of his will. Whether we like that or we don't, it's still the truth. It's still the truth. It is absolute evidence. If you'll take notice of what you're saying, if it's contrary to the word, then that's evidence to you, which is good to help you, that we're not filled with the knowledge of his word, that we're believing the wrong thing. Because what we believe, whether we're believing wrong, uh, we're going to say it. We're going to say it. So let's look at this, Mark eleven twenty three, 23, and then we'll look at Romans uh, 10, verse 9 and 10. Because it's what we say that brings things to pass, mixed with faith. And friend, I'm going to tell you this, you're going to say from your heart what you believe. Yes. We all know that. Now, you could teach someone to say just the right thing, and then when you, in their heart, not agree with it. That's not faith. That's just mental assent. That's just getting someone to repeat what you're saying, not mixed with faith. Verse 23 of Mark 11 says, I assure you, and I mo this is after we know the story about how Jesus cursed the fig tree. And he did that as a teaching point for his disciples. And then he told them, have faith in God. He said, I assure you, and most solemnly say to you, whoever says, I'll underline it if it's not underlined in your Bible, whoever says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea and not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says, underline it again, is going to take place, he will have whatsoever he says. Right. Again, underline it. Verse 24. For this reason I am telling you, what things you ask for in prayer, Whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and they will be given to you. Yes. It's saying that creates what we have. But saying the right thing from a heart of faith, mixed with faith. And knowledge of His Word is what causes you to believe the right thing, which in turn causes you to say the right thing. And I'm telling you this right now, what is protruding out of our mouths on a constant basis is evidence of what's inside. And if we don't like what we're hearing, then let's change what we're putting in. Right? right? Because it's simply a product of what we're listening to. Our speaking is based on our believing. Our speaking is based on our knowledge of something or based on wrong knowledge, right. doubt and fear. Romans, and then we're going to close with this, Romans. Because again, I, I want us to see the importance of what I'm saying here, that it is the speaking. It's the speaking. The believing is in our heart, based on knowledge of His Word. And the saying, the speaking, is based on what's in our heart. Right? right. <clears throat> Verse 8 of, uh, of Romans chapter 10 says, But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word, the message, the basis of faith which we preach. Verse 9. This is the, the, the salvation scripture. Because if you acknowledge and confess with your mouth. With, with what? With your head? With your heart? No. If you acknowledge and you confess with your mouth. That Jesus is Lord, recognizing His power, authority, and majesty as God. And believe in your, where? Heart. 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 Believe it in your spirit. Yes. That God raised Him from the dead. You will be what? Saved. 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 Now how does that happen? We believe it in our heart. And we believe it because we've heard about it. And therefore, we say it with our mouth. Says you will be saved. Verse 10. For with the heart. This is, this, is, this is everything right here. For with the heart, a person believes. Right? With the heart. We believe with our heart. Based on knowledge and hearing of his word. 
And then with our mouth, we acknowledge and confess, resulting in salvation. Do you see that? Do you see how important that is? That words that you're saying are directly connected to what's in your spirit, in your heart. We received salvation by faith because we heard. Faith came to us and we believed. And therefore we spoke it. Same way with healing in our bodies. Same thing with laying hold of any promise of God. Any promise of God. Is it important to hunger and thirst for righteousness? It's everything. Is it important for us to meditate in His Word day and night? The more knowledge we have of His Word, the, the more we can believe, and the more we can release faith, and the more we will speak what His Word says. Yeah. Amen? We're going to leave it there for today because time already slipped away from us. But let's pray, and uh, we'll go from here full of faith, full of love, full of joy, full of the Holy Ghost. Amen? Father, we thank You for Your Word today. Your Word is life. Father, Your Word is truth. It is living, it's powerful, and it's working and producing results in our life. Father, we choose this day to meditate in your word, to keep your words, our ears tuned to what you're saying, our heart fixed on your word. And as we gain knowledge of your word, Father, we'll speak what your word says. And our speaking will produce exactly what you promised us, exactly what your grace has already provided. Father, we're thankful for today. We thank you that faith is rising in our hearts and you're receiving all the glory for it. For you deserve all the glory, honor, and praise forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, God bless you guys. Thank you for tuning in, listening today. Remember, uh, no in-person service for tomorrow, Wednesday, March 3rd. Uh, it'll be live streamed only and uh, we'll continue to make updates as well. God bless you. And have a wonderful rest of your day.